Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Eric Green, director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this day-long special symposium entitled the Genomics Landscape a Decade After the Human Genome Project. Thank you very much for coming, and I uh, can guarantee you we, we have a very special event um, in store for all of you uh, as the day progresses. Let me immediately point out to you that uh, it is DNA Day. It's April 25th, um, which is DNA Day, as celebrated every year. Now, it's a, it's a particularly special uh, DNA Day, um, and of course, the origins of DNA Day relate to the fact that, um, indeed, it's, it's uh, held each year to commemorate this remarkable discovery. Um, of Watson and Crick, the double helical structure of DNA and this famous publication in Nature. But, but it is, uh, you know, worth pointing out that today, of all days, the 60th anniversary of this remarkable publication, uh, which is the reason why we chose to have the symposium um, uh, today uh, as we're having it. But in fact, a lot has happened in the past 60 years. Um, and in fact, one of the most monumental things that's happened in the last 60 years that particularly uh, relates to this remarkable discovery about DNA uh, was the Human Genome Project, which took place from 1990 uh, to 2003. And the thing we're really celebrating today and commemorating today uh, was the completion of the Human Genome Project. Um, and that completion was announced in this press release, actually it was announced from this podium um, and associated with this press release uh, precisely 10 years and 11 days ago. Uh, where uh, the international consortium involved in sequencing the human genome and carrying out the goals of the Human Genome Project declared the goals complete and the project is over. So that's really why we are here. We are here today to celebrate, commemorate um, uh, this remarkable achievement that was wrapped up uh, 10 years ago. Um, and in fact, shown here are some banners that especially the NIHers in the audience might have seen on some of the light poles around campus have been up for a couple of months and will remain up uh, for a number of months. So what I thought I would do to open this symposium is really to help reflect back on, on what all of this really means and, and to think about uh, how much the, the world has changed. And I, I, in describing to you some of this, I, I really want to frame it around essentially a 23-year interval, if you will, uh, with three major punctuation marks, if you will. Uh, thinking back on the year 1990 when we began the Human Genome Project, uh, I can vividly remember it. I was a participant from day one on the front line, and it was a, a remarkable uh, endeavor to be a part of. I can also vividly remember the year 2003, where announced here at this podium the completion of the Human Genome Project, and there was great celebration and great fanfare. And when we find ourselves now in 2013 celebrating this uh, completion of the first decade, having now in hand the sequence of the human genome for a full 10 years. Well, these are three time intervals, if you will, to think about. And the world really has changed. If you think about, you know, we've changed U.S. presidents. We've gone from Bush 1 to Bush 2, and now we have Obama. Uh, we've changed the way we listen to music. Uh, back then, we tended to, to listen uh, on, on cassette tapes. Uh, but then by 2003, we were using Discman, and we were using uh, CDs. Um, of course, nowadays, all of us use MP3 players to listen to music. Our computers seem to have changed quite a bit. Uh, back in 1990, there was the desktop was sort of the main use uh, for all of us. But by 2003, of course, we had mostly found the convenience of laptops. And nowadays, all those things are pretty much done on our smartphones. And even the way we communicate has changed in these 23 years. Uh, back when the Genome Project began, uh, the main mode of communication was the fax. I will point out, true story, when the Genome Project began, and really for about the first six or 12 months that I was involved in some of the earliest efforts to map and sequence chromosome 7, I had collaborators elsewhere who were sequencing teeny bits of chromosome 7. And the way the sequence information was being conveyed to me so that I could design uh, polymerase chain reaction assays was by fax. <laughs> the fax were the sequence that I would look up and actually try to figure out exactly how to design oligonucleotide primers. Uh, it's, it's astonishing in thinking about it, and we quickly figured out more efficient ways of electronically communicating. But that was, that was the means of, of convenient communication then. Of course, by 2003, the world had changed, and we were all emailing prodigiously. Uh, but now we've decided email is too lengthy, and so most of people are just communicating through tweets. Well, 
that's how we've communicated. What about science? Uh, how has uh, science changed over that, and how has genomics changed, and how has NHGRI changed as uh, the institute I now have the great fortune of leading? And then this is really what becomes now relevant for this symposium, these different eras for genomics and, and for NHGRI. And I, I, I can't help but remind everybody that the way the Genome Project was completed was by following a strategic blueprint, if you will. Uh, articulated in several documents, including the National Research Council uh, report and also a report from the Office of Technology Assessment. And that was uh, the earliest uh, blueprint laying out uh, how to pursue the goals of the Human Genome Project. At the institute level, we had uh, leadership of James, Jim Watson, who you'll be seeing more of later in videotape, and Elka Jordan, shown here, was uh, directing our extramural research program and serving as the institute's deputy director. If you fast forward then, uh, 13 years to the completion of the Human Genome Project, um, it all happened with great fanfare and great celebration. Um, and I could vividly remember April 14th, 2003, with the completion of the Human Genome Project, we distributed to members of, of the attendees of a symposium held right here in this auditorium uh, this uh, DVD. And in that DVD, and this is shown, the cover is shown, the image is shown here, and in, in that DVD in, included uh, burned onto a, to a, to a disk the complete sequence of the human genome as uh, just completed by the Human Genome Project. Um, uh, and this became, if you will, a, a commemorative piece of the Genome Project. It, it, was a, it was a great stocking stuffer for several Christmases to come um, and actually was put in multiple, it's this true story, multiple time capsules this was put into uh, to be unearthed at some future date. As I mentioned, uh, we had a symposium here, as we tend to do, and, and this was, uh, was actually a two-day symposium, and this is sort of some of the, the, the graphical elements uh, from that symposium. Um, importantly, once again, we needed a blueprint for moving forward, a strategic plan, if you will, and on the day the Genome Project ended, came out this publication in Nature from our institute that had wrapped up a strategic planning process and really served as um, a guiding um, a set of, of goals and uh, strategic ideas for moving the field of genomics forward. Uh, shown here is Francis Collins, a little less gray, as you'll see later today, uh, back then, uh, at this podium, um, announcing all these things about, I've, I've just alluded to, and kicking off the symposium. And then halfway through the day, on April 14th of 2003, uh, came a press conference just on the other side of the lobby out here um, that formally was announcing the completion of the Human Genome Project you have individuals like Mark Walpart, who was, who is, and soon to no longer be head of the Wellcome Trust, uh, Ari Petrinos from the Department of Energy, Ilya Sirhuni, then director of the NIH. There's Jim Watson, of course, Francis, and Bob Waterston, one of the directors of uh, one of the genome centers that had been responsible for sequencing the human genome. And then we find ourselves here now in 2013, once again guided by a strategic plan that we actually published a couple of years ago and very much articulates what we are pursuing in genomics, some of which you'll be hearing about in talks sprinkled uh, throughout the day, and once again finding ourselves at a symposium commemorating, celebrating, but also looking forward to what the field is going to bring us, and, uh, and that's uh, really why we have all gathered uh, here today. What about the science? How have things changed over these three time intervals? And of course, the thing that has driven this more than anything have been technologies for sequencing DNA. 1990, when the Genome Project began, some of those early sequences that were generated that were then put on pieces of paper and faxed around, such as to me, uh, were generated using Sanger sequencing methods and uh, radioactive sequencing in the classic sequencing ladder you'd see on an autoradiogram. Of course, shortly thereafter, and certainly what was responsible for sequencing the genome as part of the Human Genome Project were more automated methods with imagery such as this, reflecting Sanger-based sequencing results. But wow, as you'll hear about throughout the day, I'm sure the world has completely changed with respect to sequencing technologies, one of which is sort of shown in an icon form here, but multiple different technologies are now available uh, for sequencing DNA. And with that has come remarkable advances with respect to the cost of sequencing and the speed of sequencing. And you could think about it just in terms of sequencing a human genome, how much time it would take to sequence a human genome, or how much it costs. Uh, well, back in 1990 and throughout the Human Genome Project, uh, we sequenced that first human genome. Um, it took about six to eight years of active sequencing to generate that sequence, and it cost something on the order of a billion dollars. Um, but when the Genome Project ended, had we gone back and immediately sequenced a second human genome, 
um, our, our, our sequencing centered uh, colleagues and researchers investigate, you know, sort of went in back of the envelope to calculate what that might cost and estimated that if they went immediately to sequence the second human genome, it would take probably about three to four months and it would cost much less, only 10 to 50 million dollars. But of course today, today, we can sequence a human genome with these next generation sequencing technologies for something like two to three days with promises that probably by the end of the calendar year that'll be down to a day. And of course the price is well below $10,000 is more like four or five or 6,000 depending on how you calculate it. Very, very much en route to getting to a thousand dollar genome we believe in the next few years. With that of course has come the generation of many human genome sequences. 1990 there were none. Uh, by 2003 you had your first but of course today there's thousands. And, uh, and the number is growing and will continue to grow at an impressive pace. It's not just about the human genome sequence, of course, have come opportunities to sequence other genomes, other vertebrate genomes. Back then, there were none. By 2003, we had several, and today there's over 112 vertebrate genome sequences available in public databases. In terms of non-vertebrate eukaryotic genome sequences, back then there were none when the Genome Project began. By the end of the Genome Project, there were 14, and now there's uh, 455. And if you go to smaller genomes, such as prokaryotic genomes, the numbers are even more impressive, from zero to 167, and today 8,700, and I'm sure rapidly growing. This has filled the databases, of course. If you just look in GenBank and you look at the total DNA bases in GenBank, uh, once upon a time, we only had about 49 million bases in GenBank. By the time the Genome Project ended, it was up to 31 terabases and today about 150 terabases. And a lot of that data was generated with whole genome shotgun sequencing that came to the fore throughout the Genome Project. Uh, when the Genome Project began, there was no such thing as whole genome shotgun sequence data available. By 2003, there was about 9.6 terabases, and today clo closing in on 400 terabases of whole genome shotgun data available. So of course that's a remarkable amount of data, both about the human genome sequence and the vertebrate sequences and other sequences and total amounts of, of sequence data. We also turned our attention to understanding how uh, variation exists across the, the human population in terms of our genome sequences. And those numbers have also grown remarkably just in terms of knowledge about single nucleotide polymorphism, single base differences in our genome that are publicly available for researchers to use. Back in 1990, we had a rather unimpressive knowledge of just a little over 4,000 such uh, polymorphisms. By 2003, we had several million, but of course today through efforts such as SNP Consortium and, and the HapMap Project and the Thousand Genomes Project, that number is well over 50 uh, million uh, known human polymorphisms available for study. Those polymorphisms and other uh, aided by technologies and aided by knowledge of how our genome work has led our abilities to uh, be able to focus our attention to study uh, the genomic basis of disease. And we've seen remarkable advances both in rare genetic diseases involving single genes and more genetically complex diseases. In the case of rare genetic diseases, of course, you could look at it two ways. You could either look at diseases that we now know the molecular basis for, or you could look at a gene level, how many genes we've implicated in, in, in rare diseases. And both uh, ways you look at it, it's impressive. If you look at the number of diseases with known molecular phenotype or molecular basis known, uh, when the Genome Project began, there were only 61 diseases for which we knew the molecular basis. But of course, the Genome Project greatly accelerated that even during the Human Genome Project. So by the end, that number was up to over 2,200. Today, that number is rapidly approaching 5,000. If you look at it from a gene-specific basis, how many genes have been implicated with rare genetic disease? When the Genome Project began, the number was 53. It had grown considerably uh, by the time the Genome Project ended to about 1,474, and, and, and now that number is rapidly approaching 3,000. In terms of complex genetic diseases, uh, there's been similar advances. Of course, this is a far more complicated endeavor to really get at the specific variants that are conferring risk for common or genetically complex genetic diseases. Um, but what, of course, has come to be a very valuable strategy are these genome-wide association studies, developing statistical associations between specific known variants and the in and, and, and inheritance of risk for getting a particular uh, complex genetic disorder. And these GWAS studies uh, were, were, didn't exist back in 1990, and in fact, didn't really exist in, in 2003. There were other strategies, but they weren't particularly efficient. But now, fast forward, how many publications? 
um, have uh, been described, successful genome-wide association studies, over 1,500. And while we don't yet know the exact variants conferring risk for these common diseases in all cases, or even very many cases, we've learned a tremendous amount of where to search now in the genome to try to find which variants are the ones of biological importance. And indeed, uh, much of this data has allowed us to then do replication studies to actually demonstrate that indeed some of these variants truly are uh, going to be relevant uh, for conferring risk for common diseases. Uh, once upon a time, of course, it was zero. Uh, when the Genome Project ended, there were actually a handful of cases. They weren't, they weren't found by genome-wide association studies, but by other means. But, but now we have almost 3,000 uh, variants that have now been replicated as being disease-associated. Now, has that led to changes in the practice of medicine? Well, little bits here and there. I think the forward-looking talks you'll hear today will point a picture, paint a picture about how things are going to be changing um, as we think about uh, important ways of applying genomics uh, to improve uh, medical care. But there has already been some progress, and there's various metrics one could use. This is one, just in terms of understanding the genomic basis for drug response and recognizing that people respond differently because of different variants, um, and uh, that may be relevant for selecting the proper medication for the, the individual patient. If you just look at drugs for which the FDA has now recognized the importance of having pharmacogenomic information on the labels for that drug, when the Genome Project began, uh, there were only four such medications. When the Genome Project ended, that number was almost 50, um, and now that number is over 100, with, again, anticipation of that number growing with time. So I hope this has given you a flavor of these three time points across a 23-year span from before the Genome Project uh, and really when the Genome Project began, when it ended, and then where we are today. And, and really what I wanted to do in, in really going through those numbers was just to set the stage to start to paint this landscape, if you will, of the changing genomics landscape that really you're going to hear now put into greater detail um, from the, the speakers that will follow. So that's what I wanted to emphasize, but I do want to um, also say a few additional things, uh, starting with a, a huge, huge thanks. Uh, to a number of people who have made today's um, symposium possible. I, I really want to uh, give a, a, a strong shout out thanks to a group, a committee, if you will, of NHGRI staff uh, listed here who have made today possible. In particular, uh, Rudy Pizzotti and Brad Osenberger, who co chaired this group, um, and Annette Sante, who sort of handles all things logistic, who's running around out there making sure everything's going to happen perfectly. Uh, a lot of the graphics associated uh, that you'll, you'll see and have seen in the program and so forth, Daryl Leisha. And then you're going to see uh, several videos uh, sprinkled in, three of them, uh, throughout the day. And uh, Larry Thompson and his team have been responsible for these videos, and a big thanks to them uh, for putting this together. I think you're going to enjoy them tremendously. And these other individuals also thank you as well. So uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is sort of what the logistics are going to be uh, for today in terms of uh, speaker introductions. We knew you wanted to hear from the speakers uh, much more than you wanted to hear from NHGRI staff introducing the speakers. And so we deliberately put bios of each of the speakers um, in the program. And if you don't have a program, please get one. And so what we're going to do is not have detailed introductions of each speaker. I'm going to handle the morning session and just introduce the speakers. And um, at the completion of each talk, uh, we're going to, if, if people have questions, please go to microphones that are out there um, in, uh, on, the, on each aisle. And in part, we need to have people at microphones because we're videotaping all of these, uh, all the talks, and we want to make sure we can capture the questions. Um, and then in the afternoon session, Mark Geyer, Deputy Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, will be moderating. And again, we're just going to mostly be introducing speakers and keeping uh, everything moving along and on time. So I now have the pleasure, though, of introducing um, a special uh, speaker, who's the second one. Um, and, and I want to tell, oh, no, don't, don't take my slides now. Uh, I, I have one more slide I want to show. Um, and, uh, and I, I want to tell a little story uh, before I, I, I turn this over to Kirk. And the story is really, it's a, it's a, it's a feel-good story, I think, from the point of view of demonstrating how wonderful collaborations can happen within the government when good ideas are, are, are pursued. Um, when I became director of NHGRI three and a half years ago now, one of the things I was very interested in was to continue to explore ways that we could increase uh, genomic knowledge, uh, especially to the general public. We're thinking about this in many areas, but wondering how we could pursue outreach uh, uh, knowing that genomics has become increasingly relevant to people, especially as it finds its way into medical care. 
And one of the things I always wondered about, and I admit, having now been at NIH for 18 and a half years and raising children in the area, was uh, spending lots of time at the Smithsonian, especially with my kids, wondering why was it that the National Institutes of Health, which has so much interesting things going on in the biomedical research arena, and the Smithsonian, which is an incredibly impressive institution in its set of museums, uh, they're only 10 miles apart or so, and yet you walk around the Smithsonian and you rarely see much in the way of information coming out about the NIH or collaborations uh, and, and exhibitions uh, rec that uh, represent partnerships between the Smithsonian and, um, and the NIH. And so I uh, turned to Vince Bonham, who runs uh, our education program at NHGRI, and I said, we should do something about this. Let's find out if there's something we can do with the Smithsonian. And we got um, a meeting uh, with uh, the Smithsonian secretary, Secretary Clough, um, and some of his high, uh, his, his senior staff. And we had a wonderful meeting exploring various ideas of what might uh, be in terms of ways to have our institute and in genomics interact with the Smithsonian, who actually have a lot of interest in genomics. And uh, the true story, this, this happened in June of 2011, and the secretary uh, turned to me and said, is there anything special happening in genomics that we could sort of rally around and do something big? And I said, funny you should mention that. The light bulb went off in my head. I hadn't thought of it until that moment. I said, well, there's this thing in April 2013, well, 2013, we'll be celebrating the 10th anniversary of completing the Human Genome Project. Let's do something. Let's do an exhibition together. And boom, it happened by a series of, of, of remarkable meetings and developing of collaborations and partnerships. And, um, and, and the rest is history, although it's been very fast and furious and on a timeline that usually doesn't happen for the development of, of exhibitions at the Smithsonian. Um, but uh, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen very soon. And, uh, and Kirk Johnson, who is now the new director of the Smithsonian's National, National, National Museum of Natural History, um, uh, was fortunate enough to be able to get here today to, to, to briefly introduce you to this and tell you about this. And so he's the first speaker, and I'm delighted that he was able to come join and really be the first of a series of speakers in today's symposium. So, Kirk.